Yes guys, welcome back to another video here on the Andy Hashtag One channel. Today's video is episode three in the Tuesday Talk series when I get to chat to a current professional, someone within the game of football, about their journey, about how they came to be where they are today. Today's guest is Dean Linness. Dean's currently at Scottish Premiership team St Mirren, having started off at Birmingham, gone through the ranks, played for England at under 17 level, moved about a little bit, gone to the likes of Blackpool, couple of teams in the conference, Burton Albion in League Two, moved up into Scotland and is now currently playing in the Premiership for St Mirren. So we're going to be talking to Dean about his experiences and about how he came to be where he is today. Right, let's get into the video. Thanks a lot for agreeing to do this. No worries. And we're just going to be chatting through the next half hour, 40 minutes or so about you, your journey and how you've come to where you are now. Yeah. yeah. And all your experiences along the way. So just a little bit of background on you at the minute. You, you're playing for St Mirren, you're in the Scottish Premiership there, but you started off life uh, in Birmingham, you can hear the Midlands accent still, yeah. still there a little bit. Uh, you made your reserve team debut at Birmingham after going through the, the year groups and you were about 15 uh, when you made your reserve team debut there. You then, around a couple of years later, got four England caps, so you played for the under 17 team at England from Birmingham, then went up to Scotland, played for Hearts, came back down, Kidderminster Harriers from there, he spent four years at uh, Burton in League Two, made your league debut uh, for Burton. And at that point, he trained with Jordan Pickford, I believe as well, who was uh, on loan at Burton at the time. Uh, went up to Blackpool for a couple of loans, signed there permanently, played in League One and League Two for Blackpool. Then back down into the National League North for North uh, Nuneaton, back up to Scotland, St Mirren, Wraith Rovers, St Mirren. <laughs> Absolute journeyman. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, you've had a career there. You've, you've been Championship, League One, League Two, Scottish Premiership. So you've uh, you've certainly done the rounds: England, Scotland, Midlands, <laughs> North. But going back to that early start in Birmingham. Um, so actually, pre-Birmingham, how did you first get into football? What are your early memories? Uh, I think it's just sort of as most young kids, and you just love playing football. Um, and I just I remember Hells in Town Colts was my was my Sunday team, um, and just sort of I just love playing football. Um, I know in terms of becoming a goalkeeper, I know that come from my dad. My dad just used to stick me in goals in the garden and just whack balls at me. And for some strange reason, I, I seem to like it. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what, what sort of ages were you then? Uh, probably seven, eight, maybe. Because um, I remember the first, so it was under nines, was like my first sort of football club, um, proper club, which was Hal's Owen. Um, prior to that, it was sort of just, I think it was Wally Boys um, was the club at the time. But that was kind of, they sort of integrated a lot of where he was playing. So all you'd try, they'd try and mix, mix it up, you'd play in different positions, but... I think I just always wanted to go in goal. So even at that early age, you were like, right, I want to be a goalkeeper. This is me. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I never really, I never, for some, some reason, I just never looked to play in outfield. Maybe because I was rubbish at it. <laughs> so I mean, you, were, you were nine when you went into Birmingham, weren't you? Yeah. So it was, uh, I was nine. I think it was, it was under 10s was when I went on trial to Birmingham. And... I was quite young, really, to... I know they, the academy start under nine, so I was sort of fortunate in a way that, you know, I was able to to sort of have academy coaching all the way up to to going full-time. So how was that trial process? We always get a lot of questions about how do you prepare for a, for a trial, but I suppose you're nine years old. I don't, you know, yeah. how, how was that? Uh, well, I, re I, remember, um, I remember being in tears at one point because I didn't want to go. I was so set on... Just I just love playing with my mates at Hal's Owen, um, and I had it was West West Brom and Birmingham, uh, both sort of had me on trial at the same time, um, and I was my family and myself with sort of West Brom fans, and but I didn't want to go to to this. I just didn't want to move football clubs, um, and no one, my dad were, were great with me. They was like, if you don't want to go, you don't have to go, but why don't you just give it a, give it a bash, just see see what it's like. Um, so I went along and then it got to a point where I had to choose between West Brom and Birmingham and um, they both sort of wanted me wanted to sign me after the trial 
Um, and just really through, at the time, the West Brom uh, youth system, it wasn't an academy. It was a centre of excellence. Right. And Birmingham was an academy. And that was more just through speaking to my mum and dad. They Obviously, it was quite a difficult decision being West Brom fans. Our whole family's West Brom fans. Um, and knew the, the coach at the Birmingham Academy was... Uh, he actually coached at my Sunday club as well, at Hal Zoen. So I think that sort of had a little sway in the decision. The fact there was an academy and, and the coach was there. Um, that sort of just sent me towards Birmingham. Um, and I suppose it didn't work out too bad in the end. So are you still a Birmingham fan? I, I still I still obviously follow Birmingham. So I was there for, as, a, as a kid for... Well, I left when I was a seventeen, so I was at the club for uh, as maths are very good. What eight years? Um, Growing up, so seen like a lot of sort of work how they progressed from at the time when they was in the championship and they went up to the Premier League and they established themselves up there for a couple of years. So it's always been a club that I've that I've followed um, and still speak to to my coaches that I had at the through the age groups as well, um, and, and my goalkeeper coaches that I had there. So it's always a club that I'll sort of have a little soft spot for, even being a West Brom fan. <laughs> so you're still a West Brom fan is what I meant to say, and then yeah, tied yeah. a little bit, pulled pulled by the Birmingham. My, my whole family's West Brom fans. I'm saying the majority of are West Brom fans. Um, my brother's still got a season ticket there. So he still he still goes up the Hawthorns. So you, you just touched on there that you still keep in contact from your uh, your coaches through mm. those age groups here. I mean, that's got to be a 10, 11, 12 year relationship at least. Yeah. So how, how is that relationship? How does it go? I mean, that's got to be quite a strong bond that you have there with those uh, particular coaches. Yeah, I mean, I think being a, being a goalkeeper, you obviously have sort of a, a different relationship with your with a goalkeeper coach um, than what you would a, you know, a coach that's got to look after 20-odd players, whereas as a goalkeeper, it's generally two or three a year. Um, and I think the, the two coaches they have, uh, Kevin Paul and Nigel Spink, um, both had obviously incredible careers in, in the game and was lucky enough to work with them through the ages at Birmingham. And uh, Nigel... Nigel was there, the coach, when I stepped up to go full time, um, and Paulie was the coach at Burton when I signed for Burton. Um, right. And so I, I, I still, you know, they're, they're both good friends and, and people I, I'm in I'm in contact with still to this day. Yeah, I mean, what two phenomenal keepers in order to have an influence on you growing up? Yeah. Nigel Spink won the European Cup with Villa, didn't he? You know, yeah. How many years ago? Why not? So. Yeah. Yeah, I used to actually go down to Villa a little bit uh, when I was sort of eight, nine, ten. And Nigel Spink and Mark Bosnich were the two keepers there at the time. Um, yeah. I mean, it was great to watch. And Kevin Paul's had a great career in, in the game as well, various different clubs, hasn't he, and around the Midlands. Yeah, incredible. Um, so, so I was quite very fortunate at a young age to have sort of them two. So them. what, going, talk about goalkeeping coaches, because that's where I've kind of gone to now, and I'm coaching the keepers at Hashtag. From there, what is it from a player's perspective that you look for in a goalkeeping coach? Um, I think just having that sort of ability to to sort of bring the best out, of, bring the best out of you, but also just to be there, just to be like one of you as well. Sort of, so you, it's difficult to say because I think like. It, with with young kids, with younger kids training, for me, you think about you can do all the the technical work and how important it is, but see enjoyment. If you're not in, if you're not enjoying the actual training, and I think that gets sort of gets forgotten about a lot of the time, um, is you need to you need to enjoy it to get the the most out of it. So, what sort of things would you expect from your goalkeeping coach then, in order to bring that fun and enjoyment? Is it about session content? Is it about the actual goalkeeping coach's personality? What What do you think it actually is then? I think it's it's probably a mix of everything. I think the the session content, in terms of you know you you're doing the work and 
I remember being being a young, and we always used to the, the warm up was just pure chaos because it was heads and volleys, and it's okay. I think just the. Something that automatically, as a young lad, it sort of it gets you on board straight away because it's you're running around and it's it's fun, enjoyable, and then you know you sort of once that's done, you and you're looking forward then to the to the rest of the session. Um, I used to, that's that's what I used to love going into training at a night time at Birmingham, and the highlight was the warm up because it was heads and volleys. <laughs> so going to Birmingham, you started there at nine. And you've gone through the ages from there. What what were the differences in the ages as you stepped up each time? Uh, I think the way for me at the time, so we had um, there would there would change this. We would play over three different age groups as a goalkeeper. So you'd have your own age group. There would be you'd play up a year for a couple of games, and then you'd play down a year for a couple of games and at the time obviously I had no idea sort of what the the logic in that was at the time it wasn't until sort of later on you think about it and playing down the age group was obviously in terms of it was just to get your minutes on a pitch whether you was playing so you're going down you should you're going down the age you're getting minutes and really you're going with kids that are younger than you and you think well automatically I'm I should be better than all these so I don't know if that may that would give you a confidence boost. So you, you know, it just give, pick, picks you up a little bit, and um, then there'd be step. The older you got, they'd, they'd push you up a year, and you become. You knew that you had to raise your game because you're playing against kids or people that are a year older, possibly two years older, um, and that that was probably quite a big, a big thing in sort of my development. Which at the time it was just you know I'm playing football. I'm it doesn't really matter what sort of age group I'm with. Um, but I think that gives you a real sort of balance of being tested regularly. And also you've got the other one where you're dropping down and you're sort of playing with a lot more confidence as well. Does that kind of help your, I suppose, the social aspect of, of things as well? Because then all of a sudden you're mixing with three different teams. Yeah. Uh, so you can have different players in front of you different players that you've got to mix with. And same when you're talking about age groups, you become the older player to then the younger player. So you've got to have different characteristics in, in various different environments. Yeah, absolutely. Did, absolutely. Did, did Birmingham do that with any other positions or was it just the goalkeepers? That you it, was, it was predominantly just the goalkeepers. Um, obviously, there'd be being an outfield player, if you're absolutely ripping it up and you're scoring three, four goals a game, they'd try and push you on. And I think that's, I don't know whether that's still the same now with, with kids coming through, but I think it's so different being being a goalkeeper. And I think at some, at that age, you can go through games as well. You play on your own, you might not get tested for three, four weeks. And it, and then you, you tend to lose that little bit of shots. I think go stepping up and down and playing against sort of different players and also playing with the different players. You get to sort of you're not playing with the same people week in week out. You have to take you have to learn about the the other the other players you're playing with. Yeah. So I mean, you, you made your reserve team debut when you were 15 years old. Yeah. So do you think those experiences helped you when you got put into that specific experience? Probably. Well, probably I'd say definitely. Um, I was I got back from school the one day. I was just got back from school and my mom was flapping around like trying to get me some food and this and she was I knew I was on the bench um I got this mom text me saying you're on the bench and one of the goal is has, has been injured in training today but I thought it was just cause it was a nightmare of a drive to get to Solihull from where we live like the drive at Russia was absolute chaos um and the, the the Nigel Spink was the coach he he'd obviously phoned my mom and said oh once he gets back from school he needs to do this 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 just like sort of get pre match down in um, because he's playing. Um, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, I'm just going, like, I'm on the bench. It's class because I'm 15. I'm on the bench for the reserves. And it was back when sort of reserve team football back then. It was obviously a competitive league. You'd have the specific reserve teams. Um, and so being, coming up and getting a chance to go with a reserve team at such a young age was obviously like, well, it's quite a bit daunting but exciting at the same time. Um so yeah, coming back to the question, I think it probably it probably did definitely have 
have a massive help going into that game. You still there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Right. So yeah, you're you're 15. Then you're on the bench. When did you find out that? Oh, sorry, you're playing. Uh, you're 15. When did you find out that you were playing then? It was when I got there. Oh really? Yeah. It was when I got there. My mum never told me. It was just when I got pulled aside. Got the coach caught to me, Nigel, and was like, uh, "You're uh, you're playing." I think it was was it Arthur Krizjak? Uh, I think he'd got injured that that morning doing the sort of the walkthrough. <laughs> um, right. So yeah. So what was going through your mind at, at that point? <laughs> uh, probably like that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I'm sure. Uh, so there was there was first team players playing. I'm trying. I can't think who it was. It was sort of players that were on the fringes of the first team, and they'd been involved, been on the bench, come on a few times. Obviously, I'm sitting there in the dressing room as a little school kid, a little boy, really. Um, I think we went on to win 1 0 as well. And sure. you made some great saves along the way, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think you got man of the match. <laughs> so, I mean, you're at Birmingham for a long period of time, you know, playing for the reserves, and then you get your call up to the England under 17 team. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Uh, I think it was, I remember, so we played in the Night Cup. Um, Birmingham was taking teams to the Night Cup and there was obviously it was quite a big big thing um, they'd have like all scouts from from all the teams around the UK um, and obviously the FA had the scouts there they used to get refereed by the Premier League referees at the time and we'd have like a guest speaker on the first first night of there I think it was that year it was Arsene Wenger who did like a talk to all the different teams, the boys from the different teams. Um, and it was about two or three weeks after that. It, that, that was always at the end of the season. And it was after, it was after that we was in Port, was in Portugal, just on a, on, on family holiday. And, uh, mom just got a phone call from, from Spinky and, uh, said, Oh, Dean's been, uh, selected to go on a training camp with, with England, England under 16s. Um, it was for the Victory Shield games, so went along, went along to that, and um, it was, it was just, it was mental, really. Just sort of being involved for your, involved for your country, and it was seeing all the, some of the players that were were, were involved in that, and the, the the careers they've gone on to have, um, playing in the Premier League it was. It's just when you think back, you didn't, didn't really appreciate the the position you was you was in, um, and then I never I never I was always on standby um, for the Victory Shields because it was the year after. So when I was under seventeens, and I actually made it into into a Nordic I think it was a Nordic tournament we went to, um, which was against the Scandinavian countries. So that was. It was it was amazing, like just sort of playing for your country at that that age group. Um, it was brilliant. Talk us through your debut. Debut was against Sweden, um, and we had who did we have? Was it Sweden. I'm sure it was Sweden, um, and I think we I think we got beat two 0 <laughs> So it wasn't exactly a an ideal debut for your country, but it was um, it was just incredible. Like the whole the whole experience, and looking back now, obviously you look at the time, it's just you sort of you just get on with it without really realizing what's going on. Um, but no, it was it was pretty surreal, really. And how did you prepare yourself? I suppose this is actually a bigger question now. But how did you prepare? And when you were that sort of age group for a game of football, and then how do you prepare now? Is there anything specifically that you do, or is there anything that's changed along the way? I'm probably a lot more relaxed now. <laughs> in terms, I think when when I was younger, everything was sort of routine, 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 routine. Um, I still have that routine, sort of the end of the week, training wise, and doing and you know eating the the right foods. But I think when you back then, it was literally like I'll do. I'm ticking this box, ticking this box, ticking this this box, and it's it was just everything revolved around 
that you're 110% right for that specific moment. And that was just how we was brought up coming through the, coming through the, the Birmingham Academy. Um, but now I'm, I'm all, I think it's the same routine, but just a lot more chilled about it. Like we don't have my chicken pasta at six o'clock. I have it at half six, seven o'clock. Then it doesn't, it doesn't really have a massive effect on me. Have you got any rituals that you go through now? Anything that you have to do? Not particularly. No. No superstitions? No, I used to be so superstitious. And now I'm just, I think, I don't even remember when it changed. I just remember like getting all my kit before games. I'd do it all in at the same, I'd, do, I'd put it on at the, in the same order each week. And then for some reason, I can't, I can't remember why I stopped. I was just like, I think I just got a bit older and thinking it doesn't really have any of any effect for me. Um, just sort of, it was obviously just, just how you feel in your head, really. Yeah, I mean, we, I always get a number of questions about the mental side of the game, and especially around goalkeepers and the pressure that seems to be on goalkeepers yeah. and around mistakes, especially. Uh, one question that actually came in over Instagram, which is from Ryan Adamson, 994. He said, what's been the biggest struggle in your mindset and how have you overcome it? Um, so is I there think... anything in particular that you struggle with or have struggled with in the past? In terms mentally, not particularly. Um, the, biggest, the biggest disappointment I had was we lost the playoff final um, at Burton and it was my fault. Like I come for a cross, flapped it and, and we lost 1-0. And that was obviously, uh, I think I would have been 20, 22. So still relatively young. And that was obviously a real sort of kick in the nuts for, for me. Um, and it took, and being the last game as well, it's playoff final. You've, after that game, that's it. You're away on your holidays. And it was... It, it, that that took a real sort of bit of time to to get over, but it wasn't the fact that I was going back into pre season. Looking back at that, it was just the fact I think I just wanted another game to to set to set it right. That because and that's the that's the big thing. The best thing that someone ever said to me was, if you make a mistake, because we're all, being goalkeeper, you're always going to make mistakes. It's you've always got another game or another session or another ball to put that mistake right. Um, so that's probably the, the biggest sort of disappointment. But I would, did it affect me mentally? I, 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 wouldn't, I don't think it did. And then, then that actually leads nicely to the next question, which also came in over Instagram, which is from Matt Jones, Jones M310. He said, how, how do you get over conceded a goal quickly and how do you not then get hung up on it? So is there any sort of techniques or anything that you do specifically in order to help yourself when you make mistakes? Because like you say, mistakes are inevitable. Mm. And as a goalkeeper, you don't, have, you don't necessarily always have somebody to, to cover your back like <laughs> the 10 other positions do. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's just literally, once it's done, it's done. There's, there's no going back. Um, and I, I tend to go back to that, where just there's, there'll always be another ball to put that mistake right. And I think that's just sort of the mindset you you have to be in as a goalkeeper. That if a goal goes in, you make sure you save the next one. If if you make a mistake and the same things happens again, you just don't do it again. And that's the only real real bit of advice that that I've got for that is the fact you just have to. Clear head. You just got to clear head the whole time. As difficult as that can be, especially you know when you've got the you got the rest of your teammates looking at you like, "What are you doing?" And you got the fans shouting at you like, "What are you doing?" It's but it's just literally you just got to keep a clear head and and yeah. take the next one and make sure it it doesn't make sure the next ball doesn't go in or make sure you come for the come for the right cross. So flipping this on its head a little bit, that's kind of the the negative side of things. What's been the most, has, has there been a standout moment for you? Has there been a, a real higher positive uh, at all throughout your career? I think definitely, you know, what, looking up, I think I had three years, three seasons in a row as part of 
um, promotion winning squads. So well, two years at Burton. Um, so I've been signed for Burton at, uh, when we was in League Two. And so I got to see that that club go from League Two. And then I left the year they got promoted from League One to the Championship. Um, I, obviously, I was on loan at Blackpool for my last season there for a fair bit of the time. But just to see that, to see the club go from where they was when I first signed to where they was when I was leaving, that was that was a sort of that really just give you that confidence that you know you've sort of seen teams up there and and get promoted. And then obviously went to sign for Blackpool that the year after I left Burton and we got promoted again. Um, so I think they're definitely they're definitely the you know the the moments that you that you take pride in and, and look back on. So I'm three sad. promotions in a row, essentially. What what then are, are the key ingredients then from a promotional win, promotion winning team? Um, I think <laughs> team spirit's massive. Um, in terms of knowing that you're going out onto a pitch with with boys that you enjoy being around and you sort of you see as your mates. Um, and because there's there's times sort of as a player when you're on the pitch and things really aren't going your way and it's just putting bodies on the line and, and making sure that someone someone messes up then someone else will bail them out. Um, and I think there's got to be that sort of levelness as well throughout a season where you're not getting too carried away. You you know you're winning games and you think oh this is this is us we'll be all right we'll we'll stroll it um, and the same when things aren't going going you out I think we was at one point that season at Blackpool we was around twelfth or thirteenth um, and obviously the expectation for for us as players and the club was to to bounce, get that team back promoted that year um, and so you you know it wasn't sort of plain sailing it was we had to Put, put a decent run together towards the end of the season um, and we, we did that and got into the playoffs and ended up winning the playoffs So during your time at Blackpool so I'll just to touch on this for a minute you, Jordan Pickford came on loan uh, Burton yeah. oh, Burton sorry right yeah. he was at Burton yeah. so I just want to touch on this for a moment seeing he's the current England's number one <laughs> how yeah. was Jordan Pickford at the time that you were training with him Um. He was he come on loan for what I think he was about. It was for the first half of the season, but he had he had a couple of injuries as well, where he went back to Sunderland for treatment. So, I mean, he, you could tell from you know a young age he was he was fearless of sort of he was just fearless in terms of he'd come for balls that he had no right to come and get, and he'd come and get there, or he'd make saves he had no right to to make. Um, and and it was it was very good with the ball at his feet. Like he could literally kick the ball the the length of the pitch, which was obviously a massive asset for for any team. Um, he was. I think the the biggest thing I would say in terms of why he's gone on to have the career is it's just is the fact he was so fearless at a young age. I remember playing against him before he come to Burton. He was at Darlington. His year I was at Kidderminster, and he must have been. I think he was only sixteen. Right, um, possibly seventeen, and you could tell then he was just a sixteen-year-old kid, really in goals. But he he had absolutely no fear of of anything, and you know it's obviously he's gone on to have a pretty incredible career. Yeah. So, so who's the best goalkeeper that you've played with? Best goalkeeper played with, um, or, or against, or against. I'll give you that. Play with or against. Best goal we've played against was. Probably Casper Schmeichel. Okay. He was... We, we played uh, Leicester in the FA Cup and he was... He was pretty... Although he did try and... He did try and score past me once in a pre-season friendly. So I wasn't having him after that game. Um, but no, he was... You could just tell he had that aura about him. Um, and he obviously went on to win the Premier League. The, I think two years after we played him in the FA Cup. I mean, you, you've played at a number of different levels there. You've played, uh, you played for in the conference. Was it the conference North? Yeah, I think for Southport, um, and then you played 
there you go, in championship level as well. So you've gone through a number of different levels there. What's the difference between the top level goalkeepers and, and the levels underneath that? Um, I think it's difficult to say, but I think I would say the way the games, the way the games evolve sort of over the last probably five years in terms of be, the, the, having the ball at your feet has now become a, a massive integral part of the game as a game as a goalkeeper. I mean, when I was coming through, say the the academies, it wasn't really we, we do kick in and things like that, and it was something I always had a big weakness with as a young a young keeper was my kicking for some reason. Um, but I, I think there's the that sort of when that come in, that's just become an incredibly important asset that yet. You don't even you you have to have it really. You have to be comfortable dealing with the ball at your feet to to sort of. I won't say play at the top level, but I think it's something that if you if coaches nowadays and scouts nowadays see that you're not great with your feet, that's a massive red mark against you for some reason. Um, for me, if you're if you're good enough to keep the ball out of the net, then you're good enough to play at, at whatever level. And I think. Go on, what, I, was, I was just going to ask, what, what's your best attribute then as a goalkeeper, would you say? Best attribute? Um, <laughs> I'll, probably, I'd probably, probably say my shot stopping. Um, but I think in terms of, I mean, I'm, I'm quite, a, I'm a bit busy on the pitch. Like, I never shut up. I'm, I'm, I always come off, come home on a Saturday night and I can barely talk. Like, it's got a sore throat and... It's just from shouting and balling, and that's again a, a big part of big part of the game for for a goalkeeper is, is communication. Yeah, so you're now you're now playing in Scotland. You're playing in the uh, in the Scottish Premiership. What are the differences between the English game and the Scottish game? Um, the weather. <laughs> the weather's absolutely horrendous up here. Um, I think. The in terms of the the English game, and the I would say the way that teams are set up in if you look for League One, League Two, you it's quite hustle and bustle. Um, you do well to to sort of I say play total football. No one really plays total football um, apart from Barcelona or or Man City. But um, the Scottish game, it's just it's so competitive. I think anyone can, on the day, beat anyone, um, and it's and not dissimilar to, to to League One, League Two teams in that league. Get on a you get on a good run and two or three wins, and you just get momentum going. Um, I think momentum is a massive a massive factor in in sort of the level that that they're at. So I mean, you you're in Scotland at the moment. You played for three clubs there. You played for a number of clubs. In England as well, so you therefore, I'm assuming that you've had a number of goalkeeping coaches uh, <laughs> within that time as well. Who's been the best goalkeeping coach that you would say that you've worked under, and why? Um, I've been really, really fortunate in terms of the the, the coaching coaching staff I've worked with. Um, so I've obviously mentioned Paulie and Pink, who were sort of massive influences on my game at a young age. Um, and then Dave Watson coming to Birmingham, um, who obviously went on to coach England. Yeah. Um, so again, I work with a, another sort of top coach, um, and then Timo, uh, Dave Timmins, uh, was the coach that signed me at Blackpool, um, and he obviously worked with, you know, he brought Joe Hart, Joe Hart through at Shrewsbury and sort of. I think he's you know, been Tim Crawl through at Carlisle. Um, who else was there? I don't know, Timo's got a big list of all these keepers that he works with, and he was who've gone on to have sort of incre incredible careers. Um, and then it was Ward, uh, Gavin Ward as well, um, who come into Burton when. Uh, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank was the manager. And then obviously now, currently at St Mirren, I've had uh, Jamie Langfield, who obviously had a, a brilliant career at the top level in Scotland. And 
I, I, to pick a to pick a best one, I think it's they're all top top coach in their in their own right, and I think in terms of who's had the biggest influence on my career, I'd have to say uh, Paulie and, and Spinky from Birmingham, um, just because I would, just the the way they was with me at that age, um, and sort of how they how they made me believe in myself. And the fact that they believed so much in me that they saw something that I could potentially sort of make a career out of the game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've been very fortunate, as I said, to work with the sort of incredible level of, of, uh, of coaches throughout my career. And just as you as a player, then working with these coaches, because as, as you mentioned, some of them have had some phenomenal top flight careers. Mm. there as well are you constantly leaning on them for advice are you constantly asking them questions about their career how it happens what they were were doing at that particular time as well yeah definitely um I mean, especially the, the, when i was younger sort of up to 24 25 i was constantly constantly on the phone to to paulie and, and nigel just that be sort of to be one, it was more when I was out of contract, more than anything else, sort of looking for looking for a club, and then you get a couple of clubs come at once, and it'd be like, oh, well, I don't know, don't know what to do, and it'd be a case of phoning them, just sort of for a bit of guidance and and advice of what what's what they think's best best for me going forward. No, so I, I, I'm just I do read the comments that, that come in every now and again. I've noticed one that's. <laughs> Started talking about gloves uh, and whatnot, and asking if you wear Sondigos, which I can assure you that, that you don't. <laughs> and if the guys at uh, S1, so Scott has uh, set this up between us. So just no, to talk about gloves a, for a second. That's a joke. Thank you. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go on, Dylan. Uh, I don't know if that is that is that a story that you can share or not. I'm not quite sure. Uh, probably not. I thought well. that was a decent segue into the next set of questions. So yeah, <laughs> I was picking on that, but uh, so, no, so in terms of gloves, Scott at S one sorted this out. So you wear S one goalkeeping gloves. What is it that you look for in a glove? I think it's it's just it's so weird being a goalie and, and gloves and that. But I think for me, it's just that that instant feel when you. When you have a you put a new pair of gloves on, and you're training them for the first time, and if you feel comfortable in with them, then that they they work. It's it's just it's a mental battle that you're sort of having with yourself. And if you if you do a good set of first volleys, <laughs> then you're like these are all right. <laughs> um, I think it's just comfort, and you know I've, I've had gloves before where I've put them on and then I've had an absolute nuke in training. And I've never never seen them again since. They've just been they've been put to one side. Um, so I think it's just comfort. And if you you know if you're comfortable with the tools that you that you're using, then you know it's gonna it's gonna help massively. So which gloves do you wear at the moment? What are your favourite model? Uh, I'm currently wearing that amethyst. If I've said that correctly, yeah, I, say that, I said it right on his call last week. So I think. It's <laughs> And that is, this is a question that came in over Instagram as well. This is from at lewis.hrs05. So do you feel hesitant to be wearing gloves that aren't as pricey as the top line gloves? No. Nah. Like, it's more, for me, it's just, if you're comfortable in, if you're comfortable with what you're wearing, then that's the, the most important thing. Because I think the, it's a good question, but I, I would, for me, it's, it's more about the hands that are in the gloves, but if you've got the the tools there and you feel comfortable in with them, then you know it's it's that that's the most important thing. Nice, right? This is going to be the final question because it's been forty five minutes. It's gone pretty quick. Yeah, actually. So the final question I like to ask um, one of the things we haven't actually touched on: who was your goalkeeping idol growing up? But I think you might answer this in the next question. Because I'm going to give you, you can have three goalkeepers that you can have a training session with from any era. Who would they be and why? Well, I'd definitely put Peter Schmeichel in there. Um, just Which because he, he, was, he was the one that I always loved watching when I was, when I was a kid. 
Um, just the just the way he played the game. It was just the saves he used to make. It was so unorthodox, but somehow it just he just managed to to save it. Um, the next one would be probably David Seaman, just because I think the the save he made in the the cup against Chef United was it Paul Pescicilli? Yeah. Pescicilli, yeah. That, just to ask him how he saved it. <laughs> um, I think that's that's because that's probably the the best save I've seen live watching a game. Um, and the third one, who would else would I have? The third one, I would go for. Ooh, I'd probably say De Gea. Why? And I think this is probably more touched on the mental side of it because I think you look at the sort of career he's had at United and sort of how it started and. He was getting absolutely slaughtered from all angles. Um, and then how he progressed from that to sort of the goalkeeper he became over, became over the, the following years. I mean, he was, in my, in my opinion, at, at that time, by far superior to, to anyone else on the planet. Um, and I still, I mean, he's obviously, he's still, he's still a top, top keeper. I think that two or three year spell he had following that when Fergie probably left United he was I mean he, he carried them for for a good few years um, so yeah I'd probably say they'd be my three Schmeichel Seaman De Gea yeah and yourself not a bad foursome <laughs> right massive thanks for that uh, no 45 minutes or so of, of good chat it's been really interesting to uh, get to know your journey a little bit better in the highs and, and the lows that you've mentioned throughout that so some really good, good takeaways so thank you very much for that appreciate the chat no problem at all mate no worries